Cloud. All right. Hey, this is uh, a first. This is our inaugural call of Leave Nothing to Chance uh, podcast. This is on the network marketing industry and a whole lot more, frankly. The network marketing industry is an industry that uh, has been around now for a few decades. Um, and there's been a number of people that have really made their mark in it over the years. And what we're going to hopefully be doing on the Leave Nothing to Chance podcast is to interview some of the contemporary people, the people today who are influencing the industry, leading in the industry, uh, making things happen in our industry, and uh, also people who have interesting life stories because, you know, there's more to just answering the questions that I'm going to be asking as the interviewer than, you know, about their multi-level business. So we want to know about them personally as much as we possibly can. So uh, I want to invite all of you to share these podcasts with your friends, with your downlines, uh, with your children, with whoever you feel would benefit from John, the information. John, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. We'll do this again, but just hold a second okay. for me, okay? Okay. Uh, there's... I know that you just arrived here and chances are you wanted to give us a technical support, but here is what I want. Um, I'm recording this and I've started recording. I'm recording it in the, uh, in the, uh, in the cloud. Okay. Uh, and uh, if that's okay, then we'll be good because based on this particular segment, we want to have the face of John and I. Okay. Uh, so my question is, the way we have it set up, if we're recording, is it going to be just John and I? Uh, yes. Is being shown? Okay, yeah. so in that case, um, we're going to start editing from this point. So, okay. you know, if you exit, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm going to go ahead and withdraw the, uh, the, the exit. And then, you know, when you, you just go, that's perfectly okay. Okay. Thank sure. you so much. Thanks, guys. Okay, so well, let's just start again. Yes, and we'll add it from that place. So you good? All right. Yeah, I didn't like the introduction. Three, two, one. Hello, my name is John Solider, and I'm going to be your host for Leave Nothing to Chance. This is a unique podcast based on the book Nothing to Chance, written by myself and a gentleman you're going to meet in a minute here, uh, my co-writer and good friend Foster Owusu up in beautiful Toronto, Canada. Uh, Foster's got an amazing life story, and we're going to be introducing you to people who have amazing life stories. They just happen to be network marketers. They just happen to be able to share lots of information, but they're interesting and compelling people. Uh, also, I want to invite you to uh, follow us. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group uh, that we're developing for this, uh, for Leave Nothing to Chance underneath that name. Uh, we'll be having some other groups on social media as we develop uh, the podcast. But this is the first one. This is the very first one. And I felt like, uh, who better? And my co-writer, Foster Owusu, to be the very first person that we would interview about Leave Nothing to Chance, something that's been his baby and my baby now for about five years, Foster, since we started working on this, I think, right? You know, it's been a long delivery, but here we are, John. <laughs> well, here we certainly are. And, you know, neither one of us can relate to, to having a baby physically, but, you know, launching a book and a brand is... Uh, Probably not as close as you get, but we, we certainly have felt some uh, similar growth pains, perhaps, uh, in growing this product. Well, I said to somebody uh, some time back, I said, it's a major task when you have two professionals, two individuals that are equally uh, of competitive nature, putting a project together. And it's almost like we wanted to get this uh, so perfectly done. And, and that was partly part of the reason why it took us so long because we were not satisfied with just producing a book. We wanted to produce a very high quality book. And, uh, and I'm glad that we waited and gave it the, uh, the due time. Well, we did. And you know, there's been certainly things that have happened in the world uh, before we launched this book, things that we didn't foresee happening, things that even happened uh, within the network marketing industry, certainly. But, you know, I want to go back, Foster. You know, you have such a amazing life story, you know, the, the, the path that you've walked as a 
human being long before you knew about network marketing is an interesting one. Starting in Ghana uh, as a child, share a little bit about your youth and, and some of the things uh, that happened and influenced you both uh, maybe on a negative uh, level and more importantly on a positive level. Yeah, I mean, uh, John, uh, as uh, you and I have known each other for the years, um, you know, it's always good for people to get uh, perspectives on life. And, and I think, you know, part of my journey is uh, one that has a lot of, uh, I would say, dark side, but uh, on the positive side, um, you know, life has been good. But I must say that, you know, uh, I was born and raised in Ghana, West Africa. And um, unfortunately for me, my parents uh, died when I was young. Uh, my mom in particular died when I was only seven years old. And then before I turned 15, I had also lost my dad. So that part of my journey uh, was very dark and it, it's been very painful for a long, long time. I mean, to this point when I'm talking about it, I get emotional, but again, uh, I've shared this story so many times. So sometimes, um, you know, you, you just uh, hold your tears and, and make sure that people don't see too much uh, of you breaking down. But the truth of the matter is, um, it was tough, especially growing up in a country where there's a lot of love, but there's not a lot of uh, social infrastructure that supports uh, situations like some of this uh, death uh, that requires some sort of a grieving and uh, counseling that will make a person uh, to realize that life must you know, go on somewhat. And that type of uh, counseling wasn't available for me. But fortunately, I made it to uh, North America to uh, a beautiful country called Canada. And um, this is where the real magic happened, where um, I saw the opportunity where an average person uh, would, with extraordinary desire to want to do something, uh, not only for himself, but for, you know, for the greater good, can do more and become more. And I think this is where the journey of this conversation is going to take on because it's been uh, almost uh, 32 years now since I am back on this journey. And it's been such a, a beautiful journey, I must say. So, so what was it like? Uh, what, what, what month of the year did you arrive in Canada? Yeah, so I came to Canada uh, precisely in May of 1986. So, you know, it's going to be almost uh, 35 years very soon. But even in May, I must admit, uh, I experienced this uh, climate shock, not culture shock here, but climate shock. And I remember in May, I had to go, uh, I first landed in Montreal and I had to go to, uh, to a particular farm. And I'm telling you, it was so, so cold picking things like tomatoes and stuff from the farm. And I thought that was winter. I was just freezing. <laughs> and I remember being told that, uh, well, if you think this is winter, you wait, uh, give it. <laughs> But I'm thinking if there's something worse than this, then I'm in trouble. But uh, thankfully, you know, 35 years later, <laughs> I'm still alive. So, right. Well, you know, you're living and working in Toronto for all the years that I have. I have a lot of friends, you know, like yourself that are from Ghana. Uh, I've got another friend from India. And, and, you know, we always share that laugh. It's like, did they warn you guys about what winter is like in Canada? But uh, it, it doesn't sound like they gave you the... Uh, the, the real view of what a Canadian winter was going to be like. No, that there's nothing like, you know, having that experience firsthand because, I mean, obviously anybody that has gotten some education understand uh, the basic geographical, you know, um, you know, locations of almost every country because, you know, simple things like history, you know, geography, math and English, these are the basic standard course that you must take even to just finish high school. So yes, you know, we had the, you know, the general knowledge, but to really know that there is a climate that in a typical winter could be almost like being in a freezer, that, that was not something <laughs> anybody could have described. You know, just imagine I'm from a tropical country and I know that you love your fruits and you love all the, 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 the natural stuff. But if you have never tasted banana, and somebody had to describe, you know, uh, banana, you know, to your taste. 
that is not an easy job. As simple as it is, banana, I said it's sweet. You can't just give it a sweet taste to somebody without them actually practicing it and having that experience. So yes, we knew about uh, winter, but I'm telling you, there was nothing like actually, you know, touching and, 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 and feeling uh, how cold it can be. Yes. Sure, sure. So, so let's, let's talk about now. Let's talk about, you've been in Canada for, for a long time. You've built a wonderful family. Uh, your, your wife and, and your children, they're all doing well. Uh, you've had this very successful career in network marketing now, spanning many decades. Uh, you wrote a book prior to Nothing to Chance. Uh, why don't you mention your other book for a minute? Yeah, so I mean, the, the book, How to Fire a Boss and Hire Yourself, uh, was actually an inspiration where, you know, it got to a point where you are doing okay. But as you know, our business is not about just you doing okay. You're trying to find ways to inspire others. And, and I thought the title, uh, How to Fire Your Boss and Hire Yourself, uh, not only is uh, a very catchy title, uh, but, you know, it was a goal to use that as a recruiting tool and to use it as a training book. And fortunately, uh, that really gave me a little bit of leverage where not only that I could say that I've been in the industry for over two decades at a time, I could actually prove that I have uh, experienced some level of success. You know, because the moment you put your story in a book is there to stay. And uh, that book, not only that, um, you know, start gaining attention, as you know, we put it in English and Spanish. And uh, I'm telling you, every place that I have uh, had the opportunity to uh, step foot, uh, it has given me the recognition that I think we all need and deserve. And uh, I'm glad that I, I took on on that project. <laughs> so a few years back now, about five years ago, you and I, having lunch in Toronto. And uh, I said, Foster, we should do a book together. I had done obviously uh, the Moving Up series, the three books of Moving Up at that point two became three ultimately. And we decided on this and, and this concept of leave nothing to chance. But let's talk about leave nothing to chance for a minute. There are 15 very winning principles in that book. What's your favorite? Wow, uh, for me personally, I mean, this, you know, I will consider it a, a tough question, John, and I, I will say tough in the sense that I love all the 15 principles, but if I were to pick one, then it would be principle number nine for a very simple reason. Uh, you and I would not have uh, put this book together for me personally, if it wasn't because that principle talks about love. You know, here we are today, it's already going to the end of uh, January. And yes, uh, books are being sold as we are counting, but you and I haven't cashed in any check, but yet we put out our money and our time to uh, put a project that I would say, not only that it has our name on it, and hopefully it's gonna become our legacy book, but it's also a book that is gonna touch you know, many, many, many lives, hopefully, that is our goal, to make sure that what we've gone through, what we've learned, lessons that we've learned, uh, will be able to benefit somebody. This would not have happened if it wasn't love. The fact that we're in an industry where uh, a person's real achievement is based on how many people they have actually helped or how many lives they have touched. This industry, everything that, you know, principle number nine talks about, is about love because I personally don't know of any profession where the person at the very top is reaching down uh, to somebody at the bottom and say, come to where I'm at. It's almost like, you know, most of the time, you know, this industry get labeled in so many ways. If somebody has a beautiful home and that person is trying to encourage somebody to have a beautiful home, if a person is not careful, they will say things like, you're being materialistic. And it's the only industry that I know that the person who already has something wants somebody else to have it. Where I used to work, I never had a boss uh, wanting to teach me everything that he knew so that I would become just as good as he is. And I'm giving a very long answer, but to say that when you and I sat and start thinking about this idea, 
Uh, one of the things that we agreed on, we said, man, we've done a lot of great things together. We've been friends all these years. If tomorrow you and I are not here today, our children will not know the kind of relationship we have. And worst of all, uh, we may probably go in our grave leaving some great information uh, 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 unprinted. So this book you know, has been inspired by a lot of things because we are the stage in our lives that let's be honest, you and I, if we decide to be very selfish, which we are not, there's no way we're gonna stop. You and I will be able to take care of ourselves. If we don't think about families, if we don't think about friends, we can survive. So there's a lot of love in this principle uh, uh, nine that I believe if a person is gonna build this industry, they need to take that to heart to realize, you know, and, and you and I have a, a background in faith that we believe that you know, we've been instructed that the greatest of all command is to love and to love and love and love. And I'm glad that uh, we put that in there. Absolutely. It's biblical where it starts and finishes and alpha and omega and love is, is a great principle. I, I, I share that with you as a couple of others that I'm real passionate about. But uh, today's about you, my friend. So let me ask you this, Foster. You are an extremely well-read individual. And I know that from personal experience, because every time I get your car, you're handing me something else that you're reading right then that you need me to look at either quick or you're giving me a copy of. But young Foster Owusu comes from Ghana, lands in Canada, gets his job, starts to pay the bills, starts to struggle like most people do coming from another country. Somewhere along the line, somebody either handed you a book you purchased a book, you tripped across a book. Tell me the story. What was the first book that ever influenced Foster Abuse? Wow. Yeah, that, that's a big one. There's a book called The Magic of Thinking Big. And this is by Dr. David uh, J. Schwartz. And um, that book did something so, so powerful uh, for me personally. Uh, it changed my environment, um, the way I think um, for the past three decades since this book got introduced to me. It's like an affirmation book of everything that I had believed but could not put my finger on something. And The Magic of Thinking Big is one of those books that helps you uh, to look alive and put things in perspective where not that everything has to be big, but it has to be big in the way you think. You can't think small. And, and again, it's one of those books that it brought total transformation in my life. And, you know, because my very first network marketing company was big on personal development. So it was my very first book that I experienced. And um, I was glad that it landed on me because the founding president of that company was an individual who also believes in personal development. But not only that, that was the first book, it did not end there. Uh, it put me in the driver's seat where it's almost like every single month from that time to now, there's not a single month that has gone by that I have not invested in a book. So that book definitely unlocked uh, uh, the freedom door for me. So from that book, obviously that's, that was maybe the one that influenced you earliest on. I know you read constantly. If you, and, and I know this is tough. I, I've, I've asked some other people this off camera that will be asking on camera. I know this is tough, it's tough for me. So I'm sure it's tough for you. Give me the three most important books that you've read in this lifetime. Wow. Yeah. Um, Three, and that's a tough one. So one book for sure that I will go for is uh, an excellent book called The you know, Man's Search for Meaning. And it was a book written by Viktor Frankl. When I read this book for the first time, Man's Search for Meaning, it was one of those survivor books, those survivor story, obviously um, he's, uh, you know, a, um, um, an individual that um, is written uh, a book from a first-hand 
uh, experience, sort of. Okay, he's uh, a Holocaust uh, survivor. And uh, when he wrote the book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, he was actually making the case that the people who survived uh, were the ones who wanted to live. But I also like the fact that he pointed something out saying that, yes, there were people who wanted to live and they still died. So he wasn't trying to belittle the fact that the ones who did not live, um, uh, it was their fault. But what he was trying to say in the book uh, at least the gist of the book is, you know, a person must have this uh, desire to want to live for life to have meaning. Because if not, it's easy to surrender. I mean, obviously you and I, yes, we've had an amazing career in this industry, but it did not come without a price. It did not come without growing. It did not come without stretching. It did not come without, you know, making sacrifices. And all these things is what caps us in the game. Because you know and I know that people have joined this industry the same time you joined, the same time that I joined, and they did not stay or they not. They know where to be found, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. They may have moved on to other things, maybe greater things, we don't know. But what I know is it's not everybody that uh, stays in the game. And that's one thing that this book talks about. Because I am so much into um you know loving some of these live uh survivor stories another book that i love is uh by you know nelson mandela uh, a book called long walk to freedom and not only that nelson mandela is a great 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 um example of a person um who actually has the determination to fight and stand for what is right. Uh, this man endured uh, something that I would say most people would not have. And I'll give you a good example. When he was in prison, besides the fact that he was in prison for 27 years or you know, slightly longer than that, um, his son died, his first son died. And by the you know, African or South African uh, culture, um, he had to you know, bury his first son. And, and the only way uh, he could have had that opportunity to bury his son was to somehow uh, you know, surrender and withdraw everything that he was fighting for. Uh, he had to you know, uh, denounce certain things uh, for them to allow him the opportunity to go and bury his son. And he flat out refused because that would have caused him uh, to lose the fight. Now, if that does not tell you something about that individual, mm. you know, I read a quote by, um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and it says, if a man uh, is not prepared to die for what they believe, then they are not fit to live. And, and, you know, Nelson Mandela definitely is my, among many things, uh, one of my heroes. Finally, <laughs> a third book for me is um, on leadership. And the reason why this book is important, uh, in our business, obviously, we can read all the books, but um, it takes more than just being excited about life to survive this journey. So there's a book uh, that I read, it's called The Seventh, and it's written by um, a fellow by the name of James C. Hunter. And James C. Hunter talk about you know, leadership, but more so from a, a seventh leadership point of view. Mm. You know, you and I um, you know, have admiration for somebody like say John C. Maxwell, because he's written probably more books on leadership uh, using biblical principles. What I like about uh, uh, James C. Uh, Hunter's book is the fact that he told stories that almost the average person can relate to. So uh, just to paint a picture in closing on this, we know somebody like Warren Buffett. Just imagine uh, this business icon that we all you know, admire. Just imagine, assuming he disappeared, um, and we don't hear about Warren Buffett. And then you and I decide to maybe one day go on a retreat. 
and you check into, uh, let's say, a little lodge, not a hotel, nothing fancy, only to find out that, you know, your toilet is leaking, something is wrong, you know, so they, you call for, 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 for a plumber. And guess who showed up? Somebody that looks like Warren Buffett. <laughs> you can tell that this is Warren Buffett, but you couldn't really call him Warren Buffett because now he's using a different name. And in no time, you get to realize that it's actually Warren Buffett coming to fix your toilet. Just <laughs> right there. And he told the story in, in such a way that if a person like Warren Buffett can serve you and I, and of course you and I have examples in the Bible where we know what Jesus did, mm -hmm. you know, before, you know, he went on the cross, he washed his disciples' feet. So you and I is nothing new, but what I'm saying is to the average person who is in the business world, reading a book like that, I mean, you know, we're in a business where you know that our ego can actually get out of hand because once you have accomplished something, you feel that you should get all the attention. And that can also uh, uh, get in the way of uh, even bigger success. So reading books like that on leadership for me is humbling and uh, I'm just uh, uh, all in for such knowledge. Uh, yeah, I, and I think, you know, just to add to that too, I, I think when you, when you write, like, you know, you and I have, you know, a few books in our, in our lives, but uh, you realize what some of these people were going through, you know, to your point, you know, um, uh, to be able to capture it and then to have to relive it in some cases, you know what I mean? You know, sometimes they're very horrible uh, experiences, you know, for example, but let's talk about now. Um, I know you share in the philosophy that I do, that all leaders do, that all leaders are readers and all readers are leaders, right? It works both ways. Um, what are you reading? Well, I mean, right now I'm reading a book that it happens to be right in front of me. It's a book uh, by uh, Dr. Alan uh, Zimmerman. It's called The, uh, the Payoff Principle. And I'm reading this book because, uh, you know, we're at a point in our lives where, yes, from day one, we had our why before us. And every time that I talk about why, I want to be very careful because uh, for some people, being driven by why, they think you should have your how before the why. For me, it's the opposite, because I'll tell you why. If I did not have a why reason, it would be very difficult for me to get up every single day and do what I do. If I did not have the family responsibility, if I did not have the desire to make sure that I am there to support my family, and to give them the very best that life has to offer, I could be just the average lazy boy because some people have chosen that. Uh, they are minimalist and it's okay and it's working for them. But even today, when I'm doing something, even if it's to reward somebody first, I still wanna know the payoff. I still wanna know, am I doing this uh, knowing that it's gonna better somebody's life? Because if it is going to better somebody, then there's a payoff. It doesn't have to be my payoff, uh, but you cannot, I don't know how a person can get anything done without a big why behind it. You know, on the same note, when I wrote my first book, chapter one, I talked about, you know, having this emotional why, and I used the gazelle and the lion. And the reason why I'm fascinated about this why is because I have been on a safari and because again, the background I'm, you know, I have, I have watched the way the lion and the gazelle really operate when they are on the safari. Mm. When the gazelle wakes in the morning, it knows it must run, but it doesn't end there. The lioness also knows it must run, but it must outrun the gazelle. Otherwise it's gonna go to bed hungry. Mm. But at the same time, the gazelle also knows that it must outrun the lioness, otherwise it's gonna be dead. So when you know that you're gonna become somebody's breakfast or lunch or dinner, do you just sit back and just relax? You know, it's easy to cross your fingers and say things will work out without any action. And even though you and I believe that things will work out because almost every challenge that, that we, we, we face 
uh, either uh, 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 collectively or individually. One of the things that I, you know, among many things that I, I, I really uh, like about you and our friendship is you always come up with this, we'll figure it out, we'll figure mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it comes so easy, but it's almost like, okay, let's find out what the problem is. Let's come up with a solution. Well, things like this, this type of creative way of solving problem would not have happened without some level of knowledge and also a reason why we need to do those things to solve the problem because they can easily get in the way of our successes, distractions here and there. So the payoff principle is a new book that I'm reading and it's, uh, it's exciting. Great, great. Sounds great. I got to check that one out. The, 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 all the other ones you mentioned, I'm very familiar with, but that's a new one for me and for our listeners. And, and that's, you know, once again, Foster, uh, I know you share the same sentiment is, look, I mean, you know, we've written books that we want people obviously to read because if you're in network marketing, you should read them. You know, we're from the trenches. You know, we do this for a living. We support our families, you know, through network marketing. So we, when we write a book, you can bet we've done the stuff in the book. Uh, you can't always count on that So with some folks, but uh, all these other books too are going to bless you and build an abundance of books. You know, we, when you're gone to the next life and your kids go through your stuff, make sure there's some really good books, some books that they're going to value, that they're going to read, that they're going to share with your grandkids. You know, your, your TV set will be replaced. It'll be outdated probably by the time you get it anyway, but books never get old concepts never get old. So let's talk about another concept, Foster, unrelated to books. Uh, but of course, everything relates back to reading and knowledge. Um, you know, we're in an industry where a lot of new people are joining the industry right now because of, of a lot of factors, obviously, the biggest one being the, the pandemic, certainly, uh, has forced people that uh, perhaps were never thinking of getting involved in network marketing to say, hey, let me let me make sure I got a plan B. Your advice to a new person getting started to get off to a fast start. What are the things they can do the first two days, the first two weeks, the first two months to really ramp up and get their business started? Even if they're part-time, even if they go back to do whatever they did previously when the pandemic goes away, hopefully it will. Uh, but you know, when it does, if it does, or if it doesn't for that matter, what should they do to build a business quickly and efficiently to get themselves started in this extra time that people now have being home so much? Well, John, I mean, obviously, if a person has already made a decision, but they are fairly new, you know, my recommendation would be, you know, work closely with the person who introduced you to the company. But please, 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 find out somebody in that line of leadership, find out somebody who is successful somebody who has attained a level of success, somebody who has something that you want, because this is the person you want to start speaking with and talking to on a regular basis. It is something that most people don't do, but I'm telling you, it will save you a lot of uh, problem and uh, time because more often than not, you have somebody come into our uh, type of industry and they are looking at the person that introduced them and that person may not necessarily have the drive. So you may come from behind, but you want something bigger and better. And if you don't have somebody that can inspire you, that can hinder your success. So you want to quickly uh, get hold of somebody. That's the very first thing. The second thing is you want to start learning everything, uh, but learn in a way that, you know, you're going to start thinking about how I'm going to teach it to somebody. Because you see, if you are learning something with no future plans of teaching it to somebody, you can be very casual about it. And our business, the real success, is not about how well you're doing, but how well you and your team are doing. So everything that you're going to be learning, uh, make sure that you will be able to teach. And to do that, you have to learn it well. You know, I said this to somebody the other day, I was talking and I was, you and I know that every time we sit in front of somebody that we will we'll consider a mentor, the moment they start speaking, we grab pen and paper, we start taking notes. And the reason why we do that is because we don't want to miss anything. So here exactly last week, I was talking to somebody and I'm in, into something very deep. And all I could see was the person was sitting there listening. And all I had to say to this person was, 
if you know that this information that you are taking from me is something that you're going to have to teach somebody, would you change the way you are listening to me? And right away, the person grabbed pen and paper. <laughs> so you see the difference. He was relying on his memory, but the moment he realized that at some point he may have to go and teach somebody, it changed the attitude. So you and I would not be sitting here today doing what we're doing today if we had not taken notes. You know, we're not the smartest people, but frankly, there's enough evidence that we were a good student. And that's why we're here, we, 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 where we are today. That being, being good students, for sure, we can bet on that. Well, absolutely. And, and you know, you had the privilege uh, that a lot of people, uh, because he's been gone for a few years now and he was, he was up there in years, uh, so a lot of people never had a chance to meet him. But I know you spent time with uh, one of the greats, one of the, the pillars of this industry, Mr. Rich DeVos, way back. What was that experience like? Wow, wow, wow. John, I didn't know you were going to go there. Yeah, I mean, uh, this man has been gone a few years now, but I can tell you his spirit lives in my home because I actually have stuff in my home with his name on it that was personally presented to me. And uh, it says, an evening, it says, you are the difference, an evening with Rich. And of course, you know, his name is Rich Divorce. Uh, but I'll tell you this, when I first joined his company, there was a contest going on uh, similar to our incentive trips and stuff like that. And uh, I was new in the industry. I've never joined any network marketing company, but I was hungry for something. And um, the, the, the recommendation from my leader at the time was, well, if you really, really want to meet this man the way you've been talking about, then you need to qualify because that's the only place you get to meet him. And I said, really, what do I need to do? And of course, he showed me at the time you need to you know, qualify for a particular rank. And um, all I can say is not only that I achieved that, but I achieved it in a timely manner. But at this particular banquet, you know, he came and tapped me on my shoulder. Uh, and I'm meeting this man for the first time. So just imagine being tapped on the shoulder. He goes, son, you have the right posture. You keep doing what you're doing. And I guarantee you, you become successful someday. Now, that feeling has never left me. It's been a good 31 going 32 years. And I can tell you, if you imagine, even way back then, there was a list of um, um, the world 101 richest people on the Fortune magazine. And he was somewhere around number 65. And these were all billionaires. So uh, apart from his wisdom, uh, his uh, life accomplishments alone to say that, not only that I've read a lot of his books, but to have met this man who tapped me on the shoulder, that was just the best blessing. So yeah, good memory, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I've, seen, I've seen some of the pictures that, that, that you have with them. And uh, it was special because, you know, th those, you know, those early pioneers of our industry, you know, you and I were lucky to, to, to know, you know, one or more of, and, and uh, you know, some of the newer folks that we'll be interviewing on here, they never had that opportunity to meet those people. So uh, it's a blessing. And of course, you know, you stand on shoulders of giants when you are in the industry, as long as you've been, and you started where you started and, and you met Rich DeVos and Rich DeVos believed in you before anybody probably believed in you besides you. You gotta believe in yourself first, right? Or you wouldn't have shown up, you know. But uh, what a blessing that must have been. So, so uh, as we wrap up here, Foster, just uh, last couple of words of advice to the folks that are going to be listening to this across the world over the next few years. Well, John, I mean, the industry has changed uh, quite a bit, and particularly during this uh, era, if it's safe to say, this era of pandemic. You know, there was a time when you tell people that you can actually build a successful home-based business. Uh, you know, it's, um, you know, it was a joke for some people. They didn't know that you could actually work from home. And I can tell you, since the beginning of this pandemic, there are a lot of co corporate executives uh, who have uh, made it possible for their staffs to work from home. And uh, people are beginning to realize that you can work from home. A day like today, I can tell you, it has snowed quite a bit here in Toronto, but I've not stepped outside my home. So I don't need to start any car to go to work. I'm seeing all, you know, all the vehicles are still parked outside. But the opportunity is so real today. You in particular, your story, among many things that you know, I admire by you from the time you left college in 1983 till now, 
you know, you've been very consistent, you know, so that focus has proven itself that when a person, you know, finds something that works, you know, it can really build a lifetime and some of this, you know, uh, generational wealth. So um, here we are talking about your success, my success, but more so about the ones to come, future uh, leaders. And even if you have something going for you right now, start thinking about plan B and plan C. And what that means is don't just hold on to that full-time job. And I think when I wrote my book, How to Fire a Boss and Hire Yourself, it was more a security statement than trying to probably alienate any employer. I'm not trying that, but my, my philosophy is, you know, if somebody gives you fish today, it will only last you a day and that's all you have. But if you can learn how to fish for yourself, then eventually you can feed yourself and your family. And that's where our type of business uh, comes in because even if a person has a job, I believe there's no better part-time opportunity than this. Because think about it, even if you have a part-time job and I've worked part-time job in my early years working for UPS and going to school and working, but after working with say UPS for say a year, if you are put in 20 hours a night, okay, after the year, you get a last check and it finished. The same way you put the same 20 hours a week in our business part-time, a year from now, a good company like ours, you will still have something to hold on for the rest of your life. 22 years for me, almost, and in your case, 24, going 25 years. You know, it goes to show that when you find a good company, um, I'm telling you, a good company, and, and every company has something to brag about, but I tell people, you know, you have to know something that is in alignment with your own core values. And fortunately, you and I have found a good company and hopefully, you know, uh, our children and their children uh, will be able to. So, yeah, it's a it's a good a good thing to consider. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Foster, I want to thank you first of all for your time, your friendship, your co-writing, uh, everything else that uh, we've gone through with uh, Leave Nothing to Chance. It's been a uh, it's been a journey. It's been a a worthwhile journey. You know, it's funny because I think we both agreed when we uh, when we saw the final copy. It was like, you know, this is really good. And not because we wrote it, it was really good. And, and it's exciting. It's exciting to put your name on something that you invested, you know, not only money and the money's the easy part, it's the time and, and, the, and the brain, you know, which uh, is unique. But uh, more than that, I think it's something here that's going to help this generation of network marketers, the next generation of network marketers and generations beyond. We've got some young people in the book. OK, like, like Carissa Rogers, for example, down in Florida and, and Giancarlo Torres in Atlanta uh, and a couple of others that are in your early 20s. I mean, and they're just they're just killing it with their companies and they're just doing a great job. I mean, they're the next generation and they're in the book. And conversely, we've got some of us old guys in the book. So we got we got some of everything in there. But um, I want to thank everybody for listening. This is our first podcast. Uh, they're only going to keep getting better and better. But the content that you heard today can't be improved upon. Foster Owusu is a unique individual, a unique man, a man who has, has worked hard at building not only his business, but building himself. And that's really the message of these podcasts is that you can do what Foster has done. So thank you for your time and uh, look forward. There's more to come. Thank you, John. Have an awesome day. You too.